Hello, friends, and welcome to this episode of the History Revolution Podcast. This week, we get to explore founding father Thomas Jefferson. But before you start this podcast, please go to thehistoryrevolution.com slash Jefferson for your free podcast companion. Now let's get started. George Washington would set the precedent of presidents only serving two terms. After his second four-year term, he did not seek re-election. The elections of 1796 and 1800 would be interesting to say the least. Elections were very different back then. Voters didn't vote for presidents. Electors were chosen by each state to represent them and in turn, those electors chose the president and vice president. They would cast a vote for president and vice president, but there was no way to differentiate the votes. The top vote getter would be the president, and the person with the second most votes would be the vice president. Well, 1796 would be the first contested election on party lines. George Washington had won the two previous elections by unanimous vote. The Constitution didn't really account for contested elections. In 1796, John Adams from the Federalist Party received the most votes from electors at 71 votes. But Thomas Jefferson from the Democratic-Republican Party received the second most votes at 68. This meant that John Adams would be president, but his vice president, Thomas Jefferson, would be from a different party. Again, these two men were once very close friends, but now they were bitter political rivals. Having Jefferson as his vice president really hampered the effectiveness of Adams' presidency. Several controversies during his four years diminished Adams' chance of being reelected in 1800. He had even become unpopular amongst his own Federalist Party. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson was the consensus Democratic-Republican presidential candidate, and Aaron Burr was the Democratic-Republican vice presidential candidate. John Adams was still the primary Federalist candidate. In the end, Jefferson and Burr ended up getting the same amount of votes. It was a tie. It would now be up to the lame duck, Federalist-controlled House of Representatives to decide the next president. Now, most Federalists preferred Burr, but Alexander Hamilton preferred Jefferson. This was probably out of spite because of Hamilton and Burr's ongoing feud. According to the Constitution, each state delegation in the House of Representatives would cast a vote to determine the presidency between Jefferson and Burr. The first 35 rounds of voting ended in a tie. Hamilton, behind the scenes, lobbied for Jefferson and was able to convince several Federalists to switch their vote. In one letter, he described Burr as a man of extreme and irregular ambition. He is selfish to a degree which excludes all social affections. He is inferior in real ability to Jefferson. Hamilton considered Jefferson the lesser of two evils. Jefferson won on the 36th ballot. The controversies of the 1796 and 1800 elections led to the ratification of the 12th Amendment. Thomas Jefferson became the third president of the United States of America when he was sworn in on March 4, 1801. This peaceful transfer of power between the defeated John Adams to the victorious Thomas Jefferson became a hallmark of the American Republic that had never been seen before. Jefferson would serve two terms and his presidency will be remembered by a number of firsts and controversies of its own. One of President Jefferson's main objectives was to shrink the national debt. He believed that the Washington and Adams administrations had made mistakes in spending, taxation, and establishing the National Bank. Jefferson worked to shrink government spending by closing unnecessary offices. We could use some of that today. He also shrank the size of the Navy, maybe not his best choice at the time. After his two terms in office, he shrank the national debt by $26 million.
Many Americans don't know this, but the first foreign war fought by the United States of America happened during Thomas Jefferson's presidency. After years of paying tribute to pirates and the provinces of the Barbary Coast of North Africa, tensions finally came to a head and war broke out between the United States and those provinces. Jefferson had researched our relationship for many years as Secretary of State and Vice President. He knew that our arrangement of paying tribute for peace was unsustainable. The pirates had a history of breaking the terms of treaties, attacking American ships, and taking Americans as slaves, even if the tributes were paid. To be fair, they are pirates. Jefferson would make his stand, giving the American Navy and Marines the authority to protect American interests in the region. It was not easy, and there were mishaps along the way. But the American victory against the Barbary pirates proved again that the United States was a formidable force to be reckoned with. One of the most memorable events of Thomas Jefferson's presidency was the Louisiana Purchase. Napoleon Bonaparte, the leader in France, had been waging a very expensive war against Great Britain and others. France had gained control of Louisiana in a trade of territories with Spain. The United States had had a good working relationship with Spain owning the neighboring territory. When France took control, the United States and its citizens dreaded a potential conflict with Napoleon. However, Jefferson saw Napoleon's willingness to negotiate. Jefferson offered Napoleon $10 million dollars for 40,000 square miles, including New Orleans. Jefferson was shocked when Napoleon countered to sell the United States the entire Louisiana Territory of over 800,000 square miles for only $15 million. This would double the size of the United States. This blew Jefferson away, and he knew it was a no-brainer, but he didn't know if he truly had the authority to act. Initially, he thought he would need a constitutional amendment, but that would take too long. He persuaded the Senate to ratify the purchase as a treaty on October 20th, 1803. The Louisiana Purchase was highly criticized by both Federalist and Democratic Republicans alike. Federalist complaints were mostly political, but the Democratic Republicans felt that it was not constitutional, exhibited government overreach, and was fiscally irresponsible. But in the end, it didn't matter. The Louisiana Purchase increased the United States' resources and power, putting the country on the path to manifest destiny toward the Pacific Ocean. After the Louisiana Purchase, President Jefferson commissioned another famous American event, Jefferson knew that we needed to know more about the continent that we live on, including the Louisiana Territory that was just purchased. President Jefferson commissioned the expedition of Lewis and Clark. Captain Meriwether Lewis and 2nd Lieutenant William Clark led what was called the Corps of Discovery. Their mission had multiple purposes. In addition to just exploring and mapping the country's new territory, they were also discovering waterways to be used for commerce and laying claim to the territory before any other European powers tried to lay their own claim. Their mission was helped by a Native American woman named Sacagawea. She helped the mission by providing knowledge of the territory and helping the Corps communicate with Native American tribes along their journey. The mission was a success in that it provided new knowledge of the territory, including new discoveries of animals and plant life. The mission also encountered Native American tribes that were unknown up to that time. After his second term in office, Thomas Jefferson retired to his beloved Monticello, where he spent his days attending to his business as well as tinkering, reading, and hosting guests. One of his last great projects was starting and building the University of Virginia in nearby Charlottesville. His goal was to create a university free from the influence of a particular church. Did this mean that religion was banned from the University of Virginia? 
No, far from it. The University of Virginia was welcoming to all denominations. Instead of having one school of divinity under one denomination, Jefferson wanted each church to establish their own seminary on campus. It was also understood that all students were expected to participate in their denomination services and religious instruction was provided to all students. Jefferson had a complicated relationship with slavery throughout his life. He inherited slaves from his father and his uncle. His business relied upon the use of slaves. He and other founding fathers did not agree with slavery, but they knew in order to have unity throughout the original 13 states that slavery would have to be a part of the new country initially. Jefferson denounced slavery several times throughout his life and political career. Although he did believe that Africans were inferior, he also believed that they were entitled by God to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He supported a plan for gradual freedom and eventual deportation to Africa or the Caribbean. As president, he denounced South Carolina for reopening the transatlantic slave trade from Africa, a practice that had been stopped during the Revolution. He advocated for and signed into law the act prohibiting importation of slaves of 1807. After their retirements from public life and the cutthroat business of politics, founding fathers John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were able to put their differences aside and rekindle their friendship. They had not communicated directly for around a decade when fellow founding father Benjamin Rush finally broke through to them. Beginning in 1812, the two made up for lost time by exchanging 158 letters over a span of 14 years. The second and third president, longtime friends and political rivals, fittingly both died on the same day, July 4, 1826. John Adams' final words were, Thomas Jefferson survives. Unbeknownst to Adams, Jefferson had passed away hours earlier. Thomas Jefferson's life and legacy is undeniable, but just like every other human being who has ever lived on planet Earth and all of our founding fathers, he was imperfect. With that being said, his mind shaped the revolution in the Declaration of Independence and set the country on a course to greatness as a minister to France, Secretary of State, Vice President, and President. Thank you again, friends, for watching and listening to the History Revolution podcast. Remember, go to thehistoryrevolution.com slash Jefferson to download your free podcast companion. God bless you and see you again next week.